welcome to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Influencing hearts and minds at home to achieve foreign policy objectives abroad isn't anything new. But many people have become increasingly skeptical of half-truths in the mainstream media that help promote regime change in other countries. As public trust wanes and more critical questions are being asked about the real agenda around intervention, are we becoming more aware of modern-day propaganda? The so-called elites will always wage a battle for your mind. To this end, it's not about what is vigorously debated in public, but rather what is left unsaid. When the alternative narratives are brought to our attention, the only option really for the establishment and other powerful actors is to play the man, not the ball, and target the people providing a different point of view. Someone who knows this strategy well, because he's been on the receiving end of it, is Professor Piers Robinson, who is Chair in Politics, Society and Political Journalism at the University of Sheffield. And we're also joined this week by a lecturer in journalism at Newcastle University, and author of Media, Propaganda and the Politics of Intervention, Dr Florian Zolman. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for swinging by. Florian, let's start with you. When we say modern-day propaganda, let's get a grip on it. What is modern-day propaganda to you? If we think about um, propaganda, I think people often have misconception about it because they might think about a very specific um, type of influencing publics, often um, relating to what you might call kind of nefarious actors or states. So it might be easy to think that, say, they the, the Nazi regime of Germany was conducting propaganda or that the Soviet Union conducted propaganda. Or nowadays, we might think about the um, Trump administration and propaganda and fake news and, and, and so on. But, uh, but if we look at, the, at this historical, um, there's much more to pro propaganda when, when we look at our own democracies. And, um, and I suppose looking back at the history, we, we have to trace back the terminology and how it changed. So what we refer to as modern day um, propaganda was actually invented at the start of the 20th century and actually relates more to um, business practices, to advertising, public relations, um, and so on. And there's a uh, quite famous book by a, a scholar, Edward Bernays, who, who happened to be the nephew of Sigmund Freud, yeah. which is actually called Propaganda. And, and if you look into the book, um, basically any, I guess, promotional um, activity you could think of Broadly speaking, he would refer to as um, being part of the, the propaganda kind of techniques. So um, um, this could be obviously advertising techniques um, that companies might use just to propagate their products to their audiences or to, the, to consumers, if you like. But it also pertained to, um, to governments and how they get their kind of views across to their populations in democracies. Yeah. One theme which is really important in Bernays' book is that he looks at World War I um, when um, propaganda was heavily used to support the war effort in the US at the time, I think also in Britain, obviously in, in, in Germany as well. But um, um, it was regarded as a quite successful campaign right. to change public opinion in the US. And in this book, um, Bernays is quite honest about it. And, and he says, I mean, I paraphrase him broadly, it's not a direct citation, but he sa says something like that from now on, in intelligent people of our countries have to make use of this in the future to influence people, whether this might be as part of governance, but it could also be, um, uh, say, if you want to uh, advocate your product, say, as a company. And um, he has different chapters basically relating to these different uh, kind of sectors in society and how essentially um, powerful people should use propaganda. And it's also quite important that, that he speaks about elites, uh, so to speak, so De he define elites. In, I mean, in the, how did he define them? I how mean, do you define them? There's not a really like um, close definition in the book, but he might he refers to say the the business roundtable in the U.S. Right. People in government, say in politic in political governments, presidents, right. people uh, also in the trade union association, but people high up in the institutions. To be fair, it's not necessarily nefarious in that sense. So it could be that you use propaganda also for positive purposes. It could be that you are part of a progressive organization, you might use these techniques. You could argue propaganda is really independent uh, in that sense of who conducts it. When, um, Piers, you uh, hear that historical context, and, and let's just bring it right up to today and, and a recent 
crisis that you were up close and personal with, which is the Syrian crisis, specifically Douma. How much of it sort of sets an alarm bell off with you? How much do you recognise as people who do have a vested interest trying to achieve a preordained goal and using those techniques uh, to be able to do that? Well, I think the reality is this is an integral part of governance in liberal democracies. I mean, Florian was talking about the history, and it was even back in the early 20th century, you had discussions about the need for the intelligent manipulation of the mind. And this is really linking into ideas that democracy is OK, but you have to manage it as well. You right, have so to manage sort of democracy. Manage democracy right. and so on. And these tools over time have become very sophisticated. And especially when you get into the territory of international affairs and conflict, you have governments who try to pursue strategic objectives, often based on a very elitist kind of understanding that they're best placed, or the foreign, co foreign policy communities are best placed to decide what needs to be done in, in the realm of international politics. And in those situations, these skills and t these tools, techniques of manipulation um, become very tempting, I think, for governments. And it becomes almost a routine part of promoting and you know, mobilizing populations to support military action. Some people understand propaganda as any kind of promotion, any kind of persuasion. But really, most definitions work with an idea that involves manipulation. It's not primarily a democratic process. It's not about persuading people to agree to invade Iraq for reasons which they understand fully and which they sign up to in the sense that they have rationally thought about the arguments and thought, yes, we need to go to war. And Iraq being a, a classic example of this now, where you had a government which was trying to persuade the British public to support military action against Iraq, without really having the grounds rationally to actually sort of mobilize that support. So what you had in the end of Iraq was an exaggeration of intelligence to present Iraq as a much greater WMD threat than it actually was. Iraq is not an exception. Um, right. This happens time and time again when you look at historical examples. And critically, there's no reason to think that it's not happening right now, today, in conflicts such as Syria, our relationship with Russia, and in other situations around the world. To be able to manipulate in that way, you are throwing logic out the window. And the point is, that isn't going to stop overnight, is it? I mean, that PR campaign, that manipulation, isn't going to suddenly cease if we're going to continue to manage these democracies. One important part of propaganda campaigns is demonization, which often seems to be outright manipulative, and you might quite quickly find counter evidence also in the public domain and documents. But it's, I think it's also important to consider that there's more subtle examples of propaganda as well. Well, instead of just this demonization. Yeah. But we do see this demonization a lot now, don't we? If I know who's to decide and who actually decides who's our friend and who else, who's our foe. Well, it's, it's incredible how reminiscent the strategies in relation to war and conflict are to what you see in the First and the Second World War, that the sort of the basic, as you say, sort of divorcing people from rational thinking by demonizing the enemy so that they respond with emotion and respond with anger rather than thinking about the facts. This is something which is tried and tested. It's, it's been going on for a very long time. I think that sort of propaganda in terms of conflict, you know, is, does seem right, quite obvious when you're not in the midst of it, when everyone's shouting that the Syrian government is killing, committing genocide, etc., people are sort of kowtowed or caught in the headlines of that. But a lot of the time, sort of propaganda is more subtle. It's about shaping the information environment in ways which don't seem to be necessarily appealing to emotion. So again, Iraq and WMD, it was playing on people's fears, but the actual discussion was quite rational and calm, talking about facts and evidence, but critically leading people down a particular path to understand Iraq as a threat. And that's quite a subtle way. And, and then there's a, a lot more techniques in terms of sort of how propaganda works in terms of manipulation of people's opinions. You don't often have straightforward lies being told because it's politically fatal to be caught out in a straight lie, but exaggeration of information, omission, misdirection as well, getting people to focus on one issue rather than another issue, are ways in which people can be led in, in a much more subtle way down to thinking in a particular way about a conflict.
I think a mission is a very big one. A mission in the case of Syria, for example, because the one thing that has clearly been omitted from public presentations or representations of the Syrian conflict has been Western and, and its Gulf state allies' support for militant extremist groups in Syria, some of those connected with al-Qaeda, for example. Uh, those are things which have really been outside of people's understanding. So when they think of Syria, all they think of is the Syrian government and what the Syrian government is alleged to be doing. And what they're not thinking about are the activities that we're involved in and we're fueling and instigating. Which are ongoing. Which are ongoing. Is this the subtlety that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly. So, so I suppose you have this interaction between what you call these demonization campaigns, which are more, I guess, straightforward and direct, but then uh, in, the, in the broader discourse about a conflict, um, obviously, especially if you look at the news media and how they report, and there's a lot of factual material that you can, can read about or, or hear about about a conflict. And for instance, think about casualty numbers pertaining to a conflict. Think about strategies, what should be done to reduce the violence and so on. This might sound very factual, albeit it can and also be part of a propaganda framework. So for instance, thinking back about Iraq, we know that the casualty figures about the Iraq war have been vastly downplayed in the media. So often, um, the, the so-called Lancet studies, which suggested um, 100,000 deaths in Iraq after one year of occupation, about 600,000 deaths in Iraq uh, I think in 2006, three years um, into the occupation. By the length of the leading medical journal in the world, but these figures often not cited in the media, rather the media would use other figures by other institutions that would suggest, uh, I guess, one-tenth of the casualties. So you, you might have a really factual discourse which might sound rational and which might give you the accurate information you think, but then there, there are some of the important studies which, as Pierre said, um, are omitted from the discourse. And if you now go back to what propaganda scholars say about how do you make propaganda effective? So you can look into the work by Jacques Ellul, for instance, who was a, one of the leading late propaganda scholars. He said in his book that propaganda re directly relating to facts is obviously more credible, so it, it might be used by people who, who are engaged in propaganda. Robert Merton, for instance, another late scholar, who called this technological propaganda, or he even coined the word or the notion of the propaganda of facts, that obviously if you just appeal to emotions using demonization, it becomes too obvious, it might backfire later. So propaganda, which doesn't easily backfire, which is rational, factual, might obviously seem to be more credible. And, and, and it is used in that way because people who are engaged in propaganda, they are fully aware of these, these kind of contexts. So, so I think we, we have to really distinguish between different kind of elements of propaganda, especially if we look through texts, as say media texts, news media, or other pronouncements. So it could be straightforward demonization, and this might be more easy to tackle, but then we might have other discourses which could even look very critical. So there was a lot of critique, say, about the Iraq war, a really heavy critique even in the elite press about how the occupation was handled, quagmire was the discourse and so on. So you could think, well, this is this propaganda, but then you wonder, like, there was really no moral critique really about this. or. Could this have been a violation of international law or a, a war crime? These kind of questions. You might find them if you dig deep into the discourse, but not on the front pages. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more about modern day propaganda with Professor Piers Robinson and Dr. Florian Zolman, let's have a look at what you've been tweeting about in this week's Renegade Inc. Index. First up, we have a tweet from Mark Curtis. Can anyone find any UK mainstream media outlet that has even reported the UK abstention on the UN vote on Gaza? Brackets. I've only seen this reported in The Independent. Is it also about what is left undebated, what's left unsaid, is it? Absolutely. It's inconvenient facts which don't get discussed, and that's a very good example of it. And this sort of goes to this idea that actually omission, what is not spoken about, is in a sense one of the biggest parts of propaganda and manipulating people's opinions. Next from Owen Jones, Tony Blair, the eternal reminder that you can help invade a country with hundreds of thousands of deaths, millions of displaced and injured, and the rise of fanatical groups, then go and work for murderous dictators and still be treated 
as a statesman by the British media. Next up, from a quote from the American economist uh, Thomas Sowell, too many people in the media cannot seem to tell the difference between reporting the news and creating the propaganda. But that is the whole point, is it not? That very subtle line that you talked about in the first half is exactly the modus operandi. The difficulty is, if we look at journalists and what they do, I mean, there's a lot of research also about, like, if you think that journalism also is part of propaganda, is this intentional or unintentional? Nick Davis' study in Flat Earth News um, suggests that nowadays a journalist might have to write 10 news stories on a day. So what do they have to do? They largely draw from pre selected pre-written PR agency material. So you have a decent approach, an honest approach, but the output might still be PR, which, if you look at the historical definition, is what Bernays said is propaganda. And finally, from Tim Haywood, uh, out of interest, can anyone name a journalist at The Times or The Guardian with greater integrity than Pilger, greater intelligence than Chomsky, or greater courage than Beely, or more honesty than any of them? serious question. One of the things that I want to talk about that you mentioned uh, in the first half, and it really comes down to vigilance. Um, you know, often we say on this program, people are very careful about what they put in their bodies, what they eat, they eat clean and all the rest of it, what they put into their minds, they are less vigilant about. And that's not always their fault. They're time poor, but knowledge hungry, and they want to know uh, what's going on in the world. But you mentioned there are groups in the Middle East that are being funded by the West, and this is part of the propaganda drive. You've looked very closely at the Syrian conflict most recently. Just explain a little bit about what you mean when you talk about that funding and what's going on there. Well, the, the conflict in Syria is, is understood in, in terms of public perception, as it has been understood, as a, as a democratic revolution which occurred and against a brutal, repressive regime. Now, the reality is that the West has been very much involved in the conflict from very, from very early on. Uh -huh. Now, what we certainly do know at this point in time is that there's been extensive support for militant groups coming from the West and from Gulf state allies. This is a US mistake that started seven years ago and I remember the day on uh, on your show mm -hmm. uh, when uh, President Obama said Assad must go mm -hmm. and I looked at uh, you and Joe and I said huh how's he going to do that where's the policy for that right and we know uh, they sent in the CIA to overthrow Assad the CIA and Saudi Arabia together uh, in covert operations, tried to overthrow Assad. It was a disaster. Eventually, it brought in both ISIS as a splinter group to the jihadists that went in. It also brought in Russia. So we have been digging deeper and deeper and deeper. What we should do now is get out. This happened because of us. These 600,000 are not just uh, incidental. We started a war to overthrow a regime. It was covert. It was timber sycamore. People can look it up. The CIA operation, together with Saudi Arabia, still it's shrouded in secrecy, which is part of the problem in our country. A major war effort shrouded in secrecy, never debated by Congress, never explained to the American people, signed by President Obama, never explained. You um, have brought this up right at the sort of critical moment when uh, everyone in the West, certainly France, the US, the UK, was gearing up towards taking action against Syria. Dubbed by the mainstream media, specifically the Times, as uh, one of Assad's useful idiots, you were on the receiving end. Uh, and i just read a little bit from uh, the Times leader from the Saturday uh, that it hit people's doormats. Given all that's known about President Assad's willingness and capacity to inflict harm on a captive population, it would take an extraordinary degree of credulity, sophistry and ignorance to exculpate him of this atrocity. Exactly those characteristics are exemplified by a small group of academics whom we report today at respectable institutions that include universities of Sheffield and Edinburgh. When you read that and uh, you're tarred as Assad's useful idiot, what's your reaction to it? in one sense, is a very obvious propaganda technique. You're asking difficult questions in the middle of a conflict. You're not pro-Assad. You're pro-truth. You want to find out what exactly is going on. And it's a very common tactic, as the tactic of calling people conspiracy theorists, or pro-Assad, or apologists. 
These are ways of trying to humiliate people in public and to discipline people so that they don't ask questions. Piers Robinson purports to be a specialist in political journalism, yet he defends outlandish figures who attack real reporting from the Syria war. Professor Robinson's idiosyncratic understanding of the concept of journalism can be inferred from his defense of Russia Today, RT, the state propaganda arm of the Putin regime. He commends RT for providing an important outlet for people who are not getting their voices heard elsewhere. I stand by the importance of people consulting a variety of information sources. That includes RT, it includes press TV, it includes looking at our own mainstream media in the West, and it includes looking at social media. And developing the skills as an individual, as a member of the public, to actually navigate those different information sources, to use your own intelligence, your own instinct, in order to determine what's going on. How much do you think that uh, the business models of the newspapers specifically and other bits of broadcast media are in free fall, therefore actually going hard for propaganda, going hard for the emotive, going hard for uh, the sensational is a lot easier than actually reporting the more nuanced uh, version of what's really going on in, for instance, Syria. Many decent uh, media economists, um, they would write in their books that if you want truthfulness, diversity of public opinion in the news, watchdog function, question those in power, these normative arrays, they're, they're, they can't be provided um, in a commercial system in a market. News is expensive. If you want um, to produce hard-hitting investigations, you have to use a lot of money. You have to, you have to feel for flack coming in by others and powerful forces and when you publish something they don't like you might have the threat of libel suits and so on we have to think about this kind of systemic problem that in a market um, you systematically underfund news and this already leads to a kind of certain output which nick davis um, calls shorn journalism churning out stuff like 40 stories by one journalist in a week, but you might as well use other terminology for that as well, relating to PR and propaganda-based journalism. And then, I suppose, after that, we have now the internet coming in, and I guess about 50% of advertising funding, which is really important to sustain commercial news media, has basically gone online, according to some studies. So it means that the mainstream news media lost, roughly speaking, about, I guess you could say, maybe about 50% of the funding, I guess if you look in the American-British context. This means further downsizing, so I suppose in, in this kind of environment, yeah, propaganda is more often than not part of the news discourse. Does that not come to a point where the public, where there is an inflection point? Where we, they say, actually, we've had enough of this. We can see through much of it. We don't really know about other bits of it, but we, we broadly, intuitively know that this isn't working for us. What would that inflection point look like? I think we're seeing some of that inflection point at the moment in terms of lowering, lowering levels of trust in mainstream media, lowering levels of trust in government and institutions. And that's making it increasingly difficult for governments to, I think, govern or to do what they want. Right. But it's also more important than that. It's, it's, we're hitting a real problem in terms of democracy. We, we, we have people who don't trust, for very good reasons, the information that they're being given. You have, I think, a ratcheting up of propaganda activities at this point in time. And the more you have of that, the further you get away from sort of ideal public sphere, rational debate, et cetera, the, the further you get away from democracy. I think we're seeing at the moment with the kind of political dissensus we see in Britain and the United States, but also through, across a lot of many European countries, we are seeing an understanding or an emergence of the kind of problems which we've been discussing with the mainstream media, public awareness, lack of trust in institutions. I'm hopeful or I'm optimistic um, that that will translate into positive political energy where people will demand better media, better government, less manipulation through propaganda. Are you worried that it could also result in a shift to a totalitarian a totalitarianism where people actually give up a lot of that uh, idealism and say someone else look after it it's better in your hands and then government gets more power and clamps down harder on those dissenting voices well i think people you know, if you look at history people do continue to fight and people right. do continue to they want to live in a society which they believe in at least to some extent i do think that governments are now shifting on to, into trying to manipulate information and you see this happening on the web at the moment 
the, all the debate over Google and the hierarchy of um, search returns, the possible emergence of you know in artificial intelligence programs and so on, which sift information. It's probably reasonable to expect that that's going on. In fact, we do know that sort of um, GCHQ and so on do spend some energy into looking at information which is out there on the web. So the potential for manipulation and control has increased because of the internet environment. And I think that that danger which you alluded to of governments trying to seize control and using new te technological developments to actually start to manage information on the internet is a re very real danger. Is the backdrop to all of this, uh, as the backdrop to other uh, times like this, if we look back historically, a crumbling economic system, an economic system that uh, what doesn't do what it says on the tin, uh, everyone's been told about the property owning democracy, the American dream and all the rest of it. And the West has to now face up to the fact that it's been peddling a system that actually isn't going to deliver on a lot of those promises. Is that a backdrop to a lot of the use of this modern day propaganda? Certainly, I think um, we, we see really strong propaganda efforts in Western democracies as well. But this might, I mean, also pertain to some hope that I think you, there's certainly a crack in, in a way that the internet has also opened up debates and possibilities. So if we think that what we might call gatewatching has become more prominent, that we see that there are grassroots organizations and individuals um, using Twitter and other software and getting quite a good amount of followers also doing independent journalism. But as I said before, I think real independent journalism based on investigation needs more than that. So you need literally millions of pounds to do serious consecutive journalism over time. Societies really need to think about how do you want to exchange that. And I think subsidies might be an effective way. I don't see another way to fund journalism. The best technique is to actually give people the skills to use their own intelligence to sort through information. And that's really, I think, the most productive way to go forward, I think, in terms of taking advantage of the information environment we have, the potential we have with social media, as well as tackling this issue of funding sort of a public sphere that's going to enable democracy and so on. And maybe also ultimately reminding people that they do have a responsibility in a democracy. I know that some people talk about the age of apathy and people, well, I'm too busy with my job, etc. But democracies... No, people have to work hard in democracies. If people don't fight for the truth, if people do not hold their governments to account and scrutinize their governments, democracy fails. And then we end up in very bad places, as we've seen in history. Piers Robinson, Florian Zolman, thank you both very much. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com, or you can tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Thank you.